Hey guys, welcome to another Flutter tutorial video. My name is Tensor. Today we're going to be talking about Flutter Flux. This is a state management plugin that's sort of similar to the Redux plugin, but it's also a little simpler in a lot of ways. I find it slightly more interesting in some ways because of its implementation, and the plugin is maintained by the official Flutter team. Before we get started with coding, I just want to go over a few of the concepts and show you a few little visuals that might help you understand how this sort of works. These visuals kind of work as well for Redux, though a few of the boxes also change. So all of the state changes inside of our application happen because a user dispatches some kind of action. So they push a button or maybe type in some kind of text and that clicks off this action which then is passed to the store which mutates the state and with flux we have multiple stores unlike with redux where you only have one store once the store changes this then triggers a re-render of all of the components which in our case is our widget tree and then of course this cycle continues when the user then dispatches another action and we can set it up so that actions can dispatch other actions and our application may automatically dispatch an action via time, things like that. Now here's the main difference between Flux and Redux. Redux has a single store, whereas Flux has multiple stores. Also, Flux was not originally a library. If you go and you look at the JavaScript implementation of Flux, it's really just the observer pattern for objects. Redux, however, is a library. It's based on this idea that we have a single store that is immutable. And with Redux, they did away with the dispatcher and said so they have a reducer and they have certain other things. Here's a pretty low resolution image of what Redux kind of looks like. So you still have actions, you still have the view, which is the component and the other one, and you still have your state, which is your store. The difference is with Redux, you have middleware and you have reducers. Middleware allows you to connect to like the outside world. So if you wanted to like grab from an API, you would use middleware in that case. And for both Redux and for Flux, this is kind of how it works with Flutter and with React. You have a store that sort of sits independent of your widget tree or your component tree. And then when the store changes, it initiates changes in the nodes that need to be changed. Whereas without Redux or Flux, this is more like what your widget tree would look like. But of course with Flutter you also have things like inherited widget and the scoped model pattern which you can use, which sort of allows you to mimic some of the advantages of using Redux without actually having to use Redux or Flux. Alright, so now let's get into the coding here. The application that we're going to be making here is going to pull from an API. Specifically, we're going to pull a bunch of cryptocurrencies from an API, and then we just want to serve them onto our screen. Our plugin is called Flutter Flux, and currently the version is 4.1.1. So that's the version that I will be using for this video. Once we have it installed, we can create a new file to actually build out our model and our store. I'm just going to call this file stores.dart. Now, even though Flux talks about using multiple stores, our application is so simple that we're only going to use a single store. The imports that we want for this file are Dart Async and Dart Convert because we're going to be talking to our API via JSON and we need to bring in that JSON and then of course change it into a map. And then we need the HTTP library and we'll alias this as HTTP. And then of course we need Flutter Flux so that we can actually build up the store properly. For this application, we're gonna have a single model. This will be called coin. And each of our coins will have an ID, a name, a symbol, and a price. And the ID, the name, and the symbol will all be strings and the price will be a double. We also want our coin to have a constructor so that we can actually set in all of these different pieces of data when we create a new coin. And we also want to create a named constructor so that we can create a coin from a piece of JSON. Our from JSON constructor is fairly simple. We just take in the map, which is our JSON. And then for the ID, we're gonna take out the ID key. 
the name will take out the name key. Our price, because it's a double, we need to parse the string as a double. And we're going to take out the key that says price USD. And then the symbol will just be taking out the symbol key. Here's what the JSON for our API will actually look like. So we have an ID, then we have a name, a symbol. They have ranks. They have the price in USD, the price in Bitcoin, and various other things. The only things that we want are the ID, the name, the symbol, and the price in USD. And if we just pull from the API directly, we're actually pulling all of the different cryptocurrencies that exist. And because we're going to be pulling these in as a stream, this won't be a problem. All right, so now that we have our coin model set up, let's create a class called Coin Repo, which stands for Coin Repository. And this will be a class to just surround the function that we'll use to actually get our coins. So this function will just be called get coins and we'll have it return a future with a stream and a coin inside of it. We can create a string for our URL and then we want to instantiate our HTTP client. And then we'll take our client and we'll call send on it and we'll pass in an HTTP get request. So HTTP dot request. We pass in get because we want it to be a get request. And then we need to parse our URL using URI.parse. So we pass in the URL and this will give us a stream that we can then use to get our JSON and then change it into coins. We can then return our streamed response and we call that stream on it to turn it into our byte stream. And then we can transform the byte stream using our UTF-8 decoder and our JSON decoder. And then we can call it expand on it to get the body as a list. And then we want to map our named constructor onto the actual JSON. All right, so thus far all of this has been fairly standard stuff that we've already gone over. So now let's actually build out the store for our application. With Flutterflux, when you want to create a store, you create a new class, and then you have it extend the store class, which comes from the Flutterflux library. Now the store in a Flux application is basically just the repository and the class that manages our app state. There are a few conventions that you want to follow when you create a store. So typically you do not want to directly mutate the data inside of the store. Instead, you want to mutate it by dispatching these actions. So you should really only consider your store as kind of like a batch of read-only data. And so if you have any data that you want to get from the store, then you attach getter methods. So inside of our coin store, we need to have access to our coin repository so that we can actually get the data and populate our store. For our main data field, we want to have a final list of coins and we'll call this just underscore coins and by default it'll just be an empty list. And then we can create a getter method for our coins called coins and this will just get our list of coins as a unmodifiable list. So basically we just take the underscore coins list and then pass it into an empty list to repopulate a new instance of this list. This application will only have a single action because we're just going to load our coins into our store and then feed them into our view. So our action will just be called final action load coins action. And of course we need to instantiate an action object for this to work. As I mentioned before, actions are essentially the only way that you can change state inside of your store. So in this case, we're using this action to populate the list inside of our store. And now that we have our action defined, we can create a constructor for our coin store and have it call this function called trigger on action. This takes in our action, which we define down here, and then it also has a callback function. In our case, our callback function takes in nothing, but because actions by default need to take in something, we're just going to put in a variable just as a placeholder. Our callback will also be asynchronous because we're going to be dealing with our stream. And essentially this callback is what will happen when the action is passed 
to the store. So inside of here, we can then get our stream by calling repo.getcoins. And of course, we need to await on that. And after we get our stream, we can then run an if check to see if our coins list is empty or not. And if it is empty, then we can just call to our stream, listen on the stream, and then take each of our coins and then add it into our list. If it is not empty, then we want to clear the list before we add all of the coins into it. Otherwise, we would be appending multiple different values into the same list. Now, to complete the pattern, we need to create what's called a store token for our store. This allows us to attach listeners to our store so that when the store's data state changes, it will appropriately update our user interface. All right, so now we can come back into our main application and start building out the user interface. I've got a bit of boilerplate already in here. We have our root widget, which returns a material app. And we've just got theme data dark in here. And this is pointing to a stateful widget, which is just building out an empty scaffold. Let's make our imports here. We want to bring in Flutterflux and we want to bring in our stores file. Rather than making use of inherited widgets for Flutterflux, we make use of what are called mixins. So our home screen state class is going to be the class that is connected to our store. So to make that work properly, we want to add in the store watcher mixin and then we pass in our home screen, which is this top widget here. This gives us access to some unique methods and it also gives us access to our store. So here I can create a global coin store called store. And then we can set up our coin store by calling listen to store and passing in the coin store token that we created in the other file. And of course we do this in our init state function. This allows the store object to start receiving updates from our actual store so that when the state changes inside of the store, our application will know. Inside of our scaffold, we'll create an app bar. We'll give the app bar a title of Flux Crypto Ticker. And then below it, we'll have a body, which is just a list view. Inside of our app bar, we can create an action. Inside of our app bar, we can add an action. We'll create a raised button. We'll give it some color and we'll give it some text that just says get coins. And then for the on pressed event, we can take our action and then call the call method on it, which will basically call this action on our store. And then it will mutate the store state, which will then allow us to gain access to all of the coins. Now, before we expand out our list view, let's create a stateless widget that will serve as essentially the container where we put in all of our coins. And for this widget, we'll make it so that it has a constructor that takes in a coin. That way we can then use our coin inside of this particular widget. For our coin widget, we'll have a container. We'll give it some padding, just 20 pixels all around it. Then we'll give it a little bit of decoration so that it has a border. And we'll make our border 10 pixels in width. Then we'll have a child inside of this container, which will be a card. We'll give this a little bit of elevation and we'll give it a color of light blue. And then the child for this will be a row. Inside of our row, we'll have a expanded. And then inside of that expanded, we'll have a list tile. Then down inside of this list tile, we can set up the title to have the text for our coin name. Then the leading part of our List tile will be a circle avatar that has text for our coin symbol, and then we'll add some font size for this coin symbol so that it'll be 14.0. And then for the circle avatar, because we want our text to be white, we'll give the foreground color colors white, and then we'll give the background color colors amber. Then the last item inside of our list tile will be the subtitle. And in here we can put in our coin price and we'll make it so that it only has two decimal point digits. So we use two string as fixed. We'll pass in two. 
And of course we want a dollar sign so we need to put in a backslash dollar sign in the string. I made a slight mistake. I wanted this to be a stateless widget not a stateful widget and for some reason I had put in stateful widget. So yeah this is supposed to be a stateless widget. Now we can come up to our list view here and we can call store dot coins dot map and this will allow us to map our coin widgets onto each of our coins. So the way this works is we just take each coin out of our store dot coins list and then we create a new coin widget with the coin inside of it and then we just put all of these inside of a list and then put that list into the children for our list view. All right, so here's our application. You can see it says flux crypto ticker and then we have our button in the right that says get coins. When we click this, it now creates a bunch of cards with our coins on them. So we have our symbol here on the left, then the name of the coin, and then below it we have our price with a dollar sign. And we can scroll all the way down and we have quite a lot of data in here. So yeah, this seems to be running properly. And if we want to say update our list, we just click the get coins button again. And this will then clear our list and then give us a new list of coins. So the important things to take away from this tutorial are how the stores work. So you've got to remember that the only thing that's mutating our store is this action. So the only thing that really drives the state of this application is pushing the button. Any other action in the application will not change the state of the application. Also, nowhere in our widget am I calling the set state function, and despite that, it's still updating the view, and that's because of our store watcher mix in. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike the tutorial, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.